This is episode number 32 of the Fine Dining Podcast. Welcome to Las Vegas. This is Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast. Helping foodies discover new restaurants and new friends. Here's your host, the founder of Mystery Meat, Seth Ressler. Hello, and welcome to Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast. I'm your host, my name is Seth Ressler. This is the podcast for foodies who love travel and travelers who love food. Here's how it works. Every week... We go to a different city and we talk to somebody who really knows the food scene there. Quite often it is a food blogger, sometimes it's a food event organizer, even a chef. Uh, And this week we are going to go find dining in the great city of Las Vegas. I've got Kelly Kunovic on the line. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. I'm glad that you're having me. So you've got a blog called Vegas Jewel. That is right. It's just spelled a little funny because my name's spelled funny too. (laughs) Which is J-U-H-L. And you've been blogging for quite a while. You've been blogging for, uh, what, six years now? Yeah, it started in 05. So it's been over six years that I've been um, detailing my adventures in Las Vegas and all my travels. And your writings have appeared in other places as well. That's right. Before I was writing for livinglasvegas.com, I had a weekly column called Vegas Values. So that was a lot of fun writing for that. I would do um, restaurant reviews or different things to check out that didn't break the budget. So we're going to talk to you a bit about that. We're going to you know, find out a little bit more about your blog, talk to you about the culinary scene in the city of Las Vegas. Uh, we've got a great restaurant recommendation from you. And then we're going to play a game called Out of the Frying Pan. Sounds fun. <laughs> So let's start with this article you wrote uh, a year ago for Southern Gaming and Destinations. Um, Tell me about some of the things that have actually shown up in the city of Vegas in the last year. Gosh, in the last year, it's been a little slower. But in the last two years, that's when um, City Center had come on board. And City Center is one of the largest construction projects that we had seen. It was over like $8 billion. And that has brought a bunch of stellar restaurants to us, which has just totally changed the restaurant scene with even greater celebrity chefs and even more shopping and things like of that nature. It's been great. And then the Cosmo, the owner that took over the Cosmo, he was a total foodie. So he sought out the best restaurants that he could find. Now, speaking of celebrity chefs, you've actually got a trivia question for me. I do. I was wondering if you knew who the original celebrity chef to open a restaurant in Las Vegas was. The first celebrity chef to open a restaurant in Las Vegas? Yes. How long ago are we talking? I believe this was like in 1996. I could have the wrong year. So it's been a while. Okay, so so almost 20 years, not quite. Hmm. So it's not Bugsy Siegel. <laughs> nope, <laughs> a little after that. Hmm. I got to think about this. We're going to come back to this. But, you know, let's talk about this idea of celebrity chefs and this concept, because I, you know, there was a long time where Vegas was known for uh, sort of the 99 cent shrimp and the free buffet line and, and things like that. And like you said, it's changed quite a bit, hasn't it? Absolutely. It's not just about like deep fried Twinkies anymore. We have probably the greatest collection of chefs within six miles that any city's ever seen. I know New York might have a problem with me saying that, (laughs) but it's really centralized here where you have multiple celebrity chefs under one roof. I mean, within just one property, you can go to Wolfgang Puck's restaurants, Emerald Lagasse, Michael Menia, and like Tom Colicchio has a place, and Gordon Ramsay's just opened a bunch of new ones. And I could probably name another 10, 12 names. How does it work if you're a celebrity chef? I mean, what is the trajectory? Do you open up a big restaurant and then you go get the book deal and then you go on Food Network? Or is it actually the other way around where first you wind up being a personality and then you come to Vegas and you open up your restaurant? We've seen it both ways. Where like we have our own local chef, Andre Rocha, who's um, over at Monte Carlo. And Andre has been here, I think, 30, 40 years, where he had a small restaurant downtown on 6th Street. And since then, he's been featured on Food Network and a bunch of other things. So then, like, the personality developed after his career really took off because then there was all the notoriety with celebrity chefs and all that. And now um, he's got the Ford Diamond restaurant, Andre's, which is awesome. It's one of my favorites. And then you have like Mario Batali, who was totally established on Food Network before he ever had a restaurant here. 
And then you have people like Sean McLean, who is at Sage. He's not too popular on TV, but his food speaks volumes. And now he's going from fine dining to some of the newer trends, which is um, making food more approachable to all budgets. So he's going to be starting a pizza place called 550 over at Aria. And when we say that these chefs are in Vegas... Are they really in Vegas, or is it just that they're opening up something underneath their brand name? Well, it goes both ways. Again, like Wolfgang Puck, he'll come in for rotations where he'll check the staff to make sure that they're all up to par. Same thing with Emeril Lagasse and Tom Colicchio. Now, Michael Mina has been known to be in the kitchen periodically. And then Sean McLean, he is in the kitchen regularly. And Andre Rochatz in the kitchen nightly. There's been many times I've dined there where he's come out to the table to see how we were doing. So it really depends on the restaurant. And most of these guys have places that are on the strip, I assume. Yes. Um, We are starting to see a trend of some chefs, not necessarily of the celebrity status, but at least that are notable from our city that they have long careers on the strip. They're starting to create restaurants off the strip that are a little bit more budget friendly and a lot less of the whole corporate culture so they can kind of do things their own way. And and this is a question I've always been fascinated with. And, um, you know, if you live in Vegas, how much of your everyday life actually involves the Strip? A lot of locals will say that they never go to the Strip unless friends or families in town where they have to go and play tour guide and show them around. And I'm a little bit different than the norm because I was vacationing here before I became a local. And I love the city. I love everything, including the Strip. So my husband and I will go down on a Sunday or Monday night, and we will go to a show. We'll go to a restaurant. Like, we actually go to the Strip a lot more than most locals do. And then when you go off the Strip, what are the neighborhoods that a foodie should explore? Right now, Fremont East is exploding. This is an area where Zappos.com is coming, and the um, owner of Zappos is really into giving everybody a chance to um, redevelop downtown. So he's been working on this container park idea that's supposed to debut late spring, early summer. And that's going to feature a lot of small spaces for eateries and shops to kind of get their start. And then once they get that clientele built up, then we'll be able to open up actual like full-on brick-and-mortar type businesses. So that's really exciting. So it's almost like an incubator space for restaurants? Like actual like containers like, that you would see like on semi trucks or like on the shipping vessels and things like oh, that. Oh, okay, okay. They're actually designed around that. It's a quick and easy way to try and get something erected and like they're modular so they can move and they can re-identify the spaces based on the needs of the tenants that will be renting them. This is almost like those portable classrooms that they drop in places at schools when, right, when there's exactly. too many kids. Right, right. It's a new kind concept and it's going to be all done locally like these containers are being built in Las Vegas so it's really exciting to see how it's going to come together. And that's in Fremont East you said? Fremont East yes and then Fremont East is over by like the El Cortez and that area has been under redevelopment for the last couple years where there's already some great restaurants established eat serving breakfast and lunch and then La Thai is a new Thai restaurant that is exploded. Like anytime you go in there, it's just crazy. So you might want to call and make a reservation beforehand. Yep. And then coming soon is a new gastro pub called Park on Fremont. And that's going to have a bunch of rotating taps and also some higher end bar foods. Not sure exactly what the menu is going to look like yet, but that should be opening in the next month or two from what I've heard. Great. So uh, any other neighborhoods worth checking out? The other neighborhood that I love is just the Summerlin Spring Valley area, which is in the northwest, southwest part, depending like Summerlin's northwest and then right below that is Spring Valley. And between those two areas, you have all these mom and pop restaurants that are owned by chefs that were previously on the strip. So like the newest one to open is in Summerlin, actually, and that's Honey Salt. And Honey Salt is owned by Elizabeth Blau, who... um, which fits into the trendiness of Summerlin, and their food's fantastic. It's all like recipes that they've made friends and family for dinner, just different foods and mishmashes that they've collected from their travels. So it's all like farm-to-table inspired. You're in the middle of the desert. Where do they get <laughs> What farms know, are you talking I know. about? It's a really, like, it's a concept that other cities do so well, and whenever I travel, it's something that I absolutely love. So right. 
the fact that they're doing it here. And that's why it's more or less farm to table inspired instead of actual farm to table. Because otherwise it'd be cactus and rattlesnake, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, we're very close to California where those areas are very fertile. So there's plenty of agriculture around us. Mm -hmm. So it's not too bad to be able to get food items trucked in or even flown in. So we can do pretty fresh things. Like we actually have farmer markets a couple times a week. So okay, we're not in a complete desert out here. Now, let me ask you, you mentioned these neighborhoods that are off the strip. If I'm a tourist coming in, would you recommend that I actually explore some places off the strip? Or would you say, eh, you know, you're here for the strip, you might as well stay there? Well, if it's your first time, go ahead and stay on the Strip and explore that because there's plenty of offerings on the Strip. But if you're a veteran to coming to Vegas and you're getting kind of bored with the high prices on the Strip or you just want to actually see what's going on off the Strip where actual people here are living and working and the foods and stuff that we get to enjoy at a slightly lower price, then definitely come off strip. Like the biggest thing is a lot of people don't have rental cars and things like that when they come. So to get off strip going to be a taxi and then you start adding up significant costs to those dinners. Right. So if you're coming in and you have a rental car, definitely get off strip. You're going to save a ton of money and there's really, really delicious food to be had. Now, what about foodie events? Are there any that are worth coming out for? Well, my absolute favorite is run by Three Square, which is Restaurant Week. Three Square is a local food bank and they partner with restaurants all around the valley on the strip and off strip. And what they do is offer discounted three-course meals twice a year, one in spring and one in fall. And they're at different price points. Like this year, it's going to be 2013 and 5013. And those are three courses. And it's a great way to try new restaurants. It's a great way to also help the less fortunate because a portion of all the proceeds are donated to Three Square. That's awesome. What else is going on in there? I mean, you've got some food truck stuff there, I imagine. Yes, we do. Streets is one that I go to regularly because that's a monthly event, and that's on the second Saturday. And that is a big concentration of food trucks. The food's more the star as where the music and art kind of comes second and third. So that's a great one to check out. And that's like right on Fremont East as well. So it's like right in that new area that's up and coming. And that's Streets, S-T-R-E-A-T-S. Exactly. And then we also have First Friday, which is first Friday of every month. And we have a good collection of food trunks that come out for that too. And that one, um, it's actually the arts that are primary and the food comes secondary. But both are really neat and it brings a lot of exposure to downtown, which is an area that had been kind of forgotten about for a long time. So this food truck trend that we're seeing across the country is in full swing there in Vegas as well. Absolutely. It's been around for a couple years now. So it was like before where we used to only have like five or six trucks. Now there's so many trucks that I can't even keep track of them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a particular time of year to visit Vegas? I mean, it's hot all year, isn't it? I suppose that depends on your idea of hot. Vegas is actually perfect in spring and fall. Um, we have very mild temperatures and it's just perfect. It just like, You can't tell the difference if you're inside or outside. Let's check to make sure your definition of perfect and my <laughs> definition of perfect are the same here. <laughs> what, uh, what temperatures are we talking? Well, in the spring, usually run around 85 degrees, <laughs> but there's no humidity. So but it's, it's a dry very 85. <laughs> and then at night, are probably about 10, 15 degrees less. <laughs> so, mean, if it's 85 inside there, <laughs> that's pretty hot. <laughs> All right. You have to forgive me. I also think anything <laughs> below 60 is now freezing because I've been in Vegas so long. <laughs> I'm sure. and, and this is one of those things. I mean, actually, you know, I'm out in California. A, an 85 degree day is fine, you know, but when I was living up in New England, an 85 degree day was miserable, <laughs> you know, so right. you're right. But you have humidity and that makes a big difference. I don't even remember what time of year I was out there, but it was hot. Summertime is very hot. Like, basically, if you come between June to September, most people are going to be miserable. But that also means that you're going to get some really great rates on hotel rooms. And then you can also take advantage of our awesome pools. So there's kind of the trade-off there. Gotcha. Well, talk to me about the trends that you're seeing, because obviously this is a place, because of the big celebrity chef aspect and because of, you know, all the tourism, this is a place where you see trends start. What are the things that you see coming? Well, the big thing lately has been every chef has had to have their like fine dining restaurant and then they moved on to burgers. 
So it was all about the gourmet burger. And then for a while, they, everybody was doing tapas or small plates. And now this big one seems to be pizza. Really? Yeah. So it seems kind of funny how basic these things are, but it's just making it more approachable to the masses where not everyone can sit down and enjoy a $50 meal, but everyone can afford a $3 slice of pizza. So it's quality ingredients and quality everything, but the prices are a lot less. So who are you seeing do pizza and what exactly are they doing with it? Well, Wolfgang Puck was one of the first ones to start to offer some pizza. But now, like I had mentioned with Sean McLean, he was bringing 550. And that's, I really believe, going to set the trend where more and more of these chefs are going to open up smaller places to do the pizza. If it doesn't come in 30 minutes or less, is it free? (laughs) Well, the pizza is usually like New York style where they have the pies pre-cooked and then they're serving you up the slices. Okay. Where we've seen that happen over at the Cosmopolitan, there's a secret pizza which is a little hidden pizza joint that's just a long hallway and you just walk up and get your slices. And then downtown we have pop-up pizza over at the Plaza Hotel. And then we have like three more places coming to Fremont that um, are going to be serving pizza. So pizza is going to be big <laughs> in the All next right. year. <laughs> Good to know. I never would have guessed that. I never would have guessed yeah. that. All right. Very cool. Uh, I know you have a great restaurant recommendation. Uh, so we're going to get to that in just a moment. And also, I got to find out. I got to know who was the first celebrity chef to open a restaurant in Vegas. So we'll find out in just a second. Before we get back to Kelly's restaurant recommendation, first, the Taste Trekkers Conference. This is the nation's first food tourism conference. It's an event for anybody who plans their vacation around food. So if that's you, if you're the type of person who, when you plan your vacation, the first thing you do is go to the computer and hop on Yelp and figure out all the restaurants you're going to eat at, you are a taste trekker. This event is for you. If you're the type of person who has ever planned a vacation around wineries, You're a taste trekker. This event's for you. If you're the type of person who will drive just further down the highway looking for the best burger that you can find, you are a taste trekker. This event is for you. We're going to show you how to plan your vacation around food, all the different places that you can go. We're going to bring in chefs. We're going to bring in farmers. We're going to bring in artisan food producers, food bloggers, travel writers, you name it. They're going to be there. It's all going down in Providence, Rhode Island this September. Well, Let me correct that. We hope it's all going down in Providence, Rhode Island this September. To make it happen, we need your help. You see, we need to raise capital in order to make this event happen. It's the nation's first. It's never been done before, and we want to do it for the first time, but we've got to raise some cash in order to do that. So we have launched a Kickstarter campaign. If you don't know about Kickstarter, it's a crowdfunding website. Here's how it works. You go on, you pledge a certain monetary support, whatever you want, 25 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, and you get rewards. It's kind of like, you know, when you play skee ball, you get tickets, you get to turn them in for rewards. When you pledge money, you get to claim a reward. You can claim tickets to the event. We've got some things up there uh, for people who can't make the event. We've got uh, a local Rhode Island artist who's doing these really cool limited edition poster prints for the event. So even if you can't make it, you can still score yourself a uh, limited edition collectible poster print of the nation's first food tourism conference ever. All sorts of other cool stuff there. You can meet our keynote speaker, Chef Matt Jennings of Farmstead. He's absolutely amazing. He's been recognized by James Beard a couple of times. He's won the Koshan 555 competition three years in a row. Fantastic. This is going to be a great event. We want you to head over. So here's what you got to do. Go over to Taste Trekkers, T-A-S-T-E-T-R-E-K-K-E-R-S.com. That's the website. Conference is called Taste Trekkers. Go there and find out how you can actually support this conference. Please, please, please. We need your help to make this happen. Really exciting event. Anybody who loves food and loves travel. All right, we are talking to Kelly Kunovic of the Vegas Jewel blog, and you had a trivia question for me. I do. That was, who was the first celebrity chef to open a restaurant in Las Vegas? Who was the first celebrity chef to open? So, hmm. And you said it was, a, it was mid-90s. Yeah. Uh, so, there's a couple of possibilities that I think in my head, uh, some of whom you've mentioned, um, Emeril. Uh, Wolfgang Puck. Is Thomas Keller out there? He's got something in Vegas, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He has Bouchon. I'm going to guess this just because he's the one you haven't mentioned. And I'm wondering if that was a, a 
conspicuous omission on your part. So I'm going to guess Thomas Keller. No, <laughs> it's Wolfgang Puck. Oh, I was close. <laughs> uh, so, so what was his first? It was Spago over at the um, Caesars Forum Shops, and it's still there today. Uh, so he really started the trend of people coming out to Vegas, huh? Yes, and it's a little bit of a trick question, too, because if you do consider Andre Rocha a celebrity chef, he was actually the very first one, and he's our hometown hero, so there would be two acceptable answers to that question. All right, and I missed them both, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in Vegas how long, about 15 years now? I've actually been here 10 years, but I've been coming to Vegas five years before I moved. How would it have looked different back when you first started coming? Well, when I first started coming, there wasn't any major focus on fine dining. Like we used to come to the Venetian and eat at this place called Star Canyon, which was their steakhouse. And that was the most stellar food that we could find in the area. Everything else was five ninety nine buffets and 99 cent shrimp cocktails. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but it just totally misses the whole like adventure that there is today with all the culinary treats. If I'm interpreting you correctly, you're saying Vegas used to be Reno, really, is what you're saying. Mm, I wouldn't put it that low. <laughs> on we, weren't, we weren't that low. I mean, come on now. <laughs> no offense to Reno. I mean, Reno's a great little place, but it's a little more small town than Vegas has all ever right. really been. I mean, we'd have to go way back in the time machine, I think, to, to get to that level. All right. So talk to me about your restaurant recommendation. I asked you, you know, where I should go when I come to Vegas. What'd you come up with? I chose my favorite restaurant to go for any type of special occasion. And that's Osteria del Circo over at the Bellagio. And the Bellagio, this is one of Terry Benedict's places, right? Actually, Steve Wynn. <laughs> so for those people who have only experienced Vegas through Ocean's Eleven, <laughs> tell us which one the Bellagio is. Well, Bellagio is probably the most famous or at least most recognizable because they have a huge lake out in front of the property. And after dark, the fountains shoot up 250 feet and they sing and dance to music every 15 minutes. And so if you're familiar with that scene at the end of Ocean's Eleven where uh, everybody after the heist is standing up, you know, overlooking these fountains, uh, that's the Bellagio, right? Absolutely. And one of my favorite things about the Bellagio when you first walk in is the ceiling. Yes, Fiore de Como. It's beautiful by Dale Chihuly. Oh, I love. If you don't know who Dale Chihuly is, and he has nothing to do with food. No. <laughs> he he is, is one of my favorite artists. He is a blown glass artist, and the stuff that he does is amazing. And perhaps one of his most amazing pieces is the ceiling there. They've just got it mounted. I've heard it's like... 3,000 pounds or something ridiculous. I mean, don't quote me on that, but it's, it's heavy. It is. It's, it's insane, and it's beautiful. And um, once City Center opened, Dale Chihuly actually got his art gallery over in the shops over in City Center. So that's definitely worth going to see if you need a break from the food. <laughs> yeah, so on your way into the restaurant, make sure you check that out. So we head into the restaurant. Tell me about the vibe of the restaurant. What, uh, what's the feel in there? It's a little playful. They have billowing fabrics that drape over the ceiling that makes it seem like a carnival tent. All right. And then who's the chef over there? That's Michael Vinton Jelly. And he's recently kind of taken over over there. But all the recipes are still those of Mrs. Maccioni. You might know the Maccioni family um, from New York. They have a Cirque. They have that TV special on HBO, Table in Heaven. Okay. Yeah. That's French, and this is like their sister restaurant, which is serving up Italian cuisine, which is based on Tuscan cuisine. When I go to a, a restaurant at a place like the Bellagio, what do I need to wear? If you can dress up like in a nice dress and a suit and tie, I mean, it's fun to do it every now and then. But people who are traveling, they might not want to pack those things. So if you dress up in just like a nice pair of khakis and like a polo shirt, no one's going to turn you away and they'll welcome you with open arms. So I sit down, I'm looking at the menu. I want to start with an appetizer. What do you recommend? I'm going to recommend either the chef special or their carpaccio because the chef special rotates regularly. So see if that kind of piques your interest. Ask what that is. And if not, the carpaccio is on their menu and it's very good. So talk to me about that. Talk to me about the, the carpaccio. What do they do with it? It's just so good. Like they drizzle it with a little olive oil and it's just so simple and 
fresh. It, it's just one that, that you just have to try. And then when we move on to the main course, what do you got in mind? Well, the main course is always a toss-up, where usually my husband and I will go for one or the other, and then we share. Because the rack of lamb is excellent. It's one of the best in the city. The rack of lamb, if you get it medium rare, it's really nice and juicy. And then it's got a nice crust of pecorino and thyme all around it. And it just holds in all the juices and it's really good. So who gets that, you or him? That's usually him because I have a hard time saying no to Mama Edgy's ravioli. What's that? It's wonderful. It's these tasty little pillows that are filled with Swiss chard and spinach and sheep's milk ricotta cheese. It is blended with a butter sage sauce. So it's rich and creamy and oh, it's so delicious. So we got two fine choices there. What do they got to drink? I mean, what are you pairing with this meal? They have a huge selection of wines. I think they have over 900 wines. Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah, with a big focus on those from Italy. Gotcha. Now, I assume they have a sommelier who can you know, help you with the wines there. Yes, absolutely. You have to have one in order to narrow down 900 choices. <laughs> yeah, I find, I find after 300, I'm really, you know, just no good. And then what about dessert? What do you recommend? Dessert, you have to get the tiramisu. It's made by angels, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I got angels in the back room, you know, in the off season. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes with a scoop of espresso gelato. And then they always give you like complimentary biscotti. And it's just like the perfect end to the meal. And if you're really lucky, you can time dessert just right with the fountains. So you can kind of dig into the tiramisu with the biscotti. And you'll see the fountains dancing to the music just out the windows. That's uh, like a perfect Vegas night right there. Yeah. Of course, I'm sure there's a price to a perfect Vegas night. How much do I have to win over at the craps table in order to, to drop on this meal? It is pricey, but it's really not going to break the bank. I mean, $70 a person is your average price, and that's going to include a glass of wine and your entree, dessert, and then they actually have a pre-theater menu that's available, I believe it's 5 to 6.30 every day. And that's $59 for three courses. Very good. Well, thank you for the recommendation. Are you ready to play a little game? Absolutely. <laughs> Here we go. This game is called Out of the Frying Pan. Here's how it works. I am going to ask you for a series of rapid-fire recommendations. Just tell me the first thing that pops into your head, okay? All right. Let's say I lost really badly at gambling, so I need to eat on a budget. Where's your favorite place to go on a budget? Favorite place on a budget is Big Wong. And their most expensive thing on the menu is like four ninety five, and they have like twenty items to choose from. What kind of food? Uh, Big one is Asian, so it's got a mix of some Thai and Chinese, and even some Malaysian dishes. Of all the, uh, and I know you've got some fancy places there in Vegas. Uh, of all of them, which one has your favorite decor? Oh, um, one of the prettiest restaurants is Mix on top of Mandalay Bay, the hotel at Mandalay Bay, and the. Dining room, stunning. It's got like these pods that are white against these floor to ceiling windows that you can see the strip and the neon and the lights just twinkle outside. But the dining room is just as stunning. So it's kind of hard to even pay attention to the food because the dining room is so beautiful. Let's say you've got kids in tow. Is there a good place to go with kids? There's two good choices if you have kids in tow. It's also a great recommendation for large groups, and that is Grand Lux. There's two locations, one at the Venetian and one at Palazzo, and they have a really expansive menu. So it's going to feed the most picky eater as well as like the gourmet eater. So it's going to spread that gap so everyone's happy. Obviously, mixology's got to be big there, right? I mean, people doing interesting things with cocktails. They do, and um, the Commonwealth downtown is a new bar that's opened. It's two stories. they got a rooftop garden, which is pretty neat, and they are known for craft cocktails. So if there's a place to go, that's kind of like the place to check out right now. All right. Let's say I'm uh, there to get hitched. I come in for one of those, you know, Vegas Chapel weddings. Uh, where's the most romantic place to go to dinner before you get married? I would say Andre's over at Monte Carlo is really charming and quaint and you get like this big old booth for just two. So you could really have like a nice meal if you were doing the whole eloping thing. And then if you wanted to do a big family gathering, I believe they can accommodate that too. Obviously, there's no clocks in Vegas, right? So let's say that uh, I've been gambling until the wee hours of the morning. Where's your favorite place to go for late night food? If you're staying on the strip, um, Allegro. 
um, over at the Wynn. It opened like until 3 or 4 in the morning, and it caters to the after-club crowds. And they have pizzas and a whole bunch of Italian dishes that are really yummy. All right, last question. Uh, if there's one place you don't want the tourists to know about, it's just your little secret. What is it? I'm going to say Windy City Beefs and Dogs, just because I am a Chicago girl, and I love my Chicago Eats. So as long as there's like not a big, massive crowd to fight to get them, I'll be very happy. And they have two locations. One is up in Summerlin, and the other one is a new location, and they're also serving pizza, and that's in Henderson. All right. Very good. You did wonderful. Thank you for playing. Uh, your restaurant recommendation is Osteria del Cerco. Uh, it can be found at 3600 South Las Vegas Boulevard, better known as the Bellagio. You just look for the big water fountain. Uh, if you want the website, it's long and confusing, but go to the Bellagio's website and you'll be able to, to find it over there. You'll also find links to everything that we've mentioned here on the podcast on the Mystery Meat website. If people want to find you, Kelly, uh, both on social media and um, online, how can they do that? I have a Twitter account at Vegas Jewel, and that is V E G A S J U H L. And my blog is also at vegasjewel.blogspot.com. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. This has been Mystery Meets Fine Dining Podcast. Uh, my name is Seth Ressler. A couple of show notes before we go. Like I said, all the links uh, we'll throw up over at the Mystery Meat website, mysterymeetmeet.org. And while you're there, sign up for an invitation to a Mystery Meat dinner. Either one of the ones that we've got going on right now in Boston and Seattle and San Francisco, uh, St. Louis, or... Get a bunch of friends to sign up, and when we see a bunch of people that are interested in a particular city, we will start doing them there as well. While you're over on the website, you can also uh, follow us on Twitter. We're mystery underscore meet, M-E-E-T. Uh, you can connect to us on Facebook. You can also subscribe to this podcast in iTunes while you're there. Leave a review. And if you want to be a guest, if you're a, a food blogger or somebody else who is an expert in the food scene, you want to come on the show, tell us about your city, hit the Contact Us link and send us an email. We would love to have you on as a guest. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. This has been Mystery Meets Fine Dining Podcast. You can find links to the websites mentioned in this episode at mysterymeet.org slash podcast. Thank you for listening. <laughs>